so everybody welcome. Thank you very much for attending our seminar. Uh, my name is Charles Small and I'm the director of ISGAP and I'm sitting here uh, in lockdown still in Oxford. And I'm really honored and pleased to be able to introduce you to Lorenzo uh, Vadino. Lorenzo will be speaking about the Muslim Brotherhood in the West. Uh, Lorenzo is the director of the program on extremism at George Washington University. He's an expert on political Islam in Europe and North America. And over the past 20 years, he's researched uh, on, on the mobilization and the dynamics of jihadist networks in the West, in Europe and in North America. He looks at government counter radicalization policies and the activities of the Muslim Brotherhood inspired organizations in the West. Uh, Lorenzo Vadino is originally from Italy. Uh, he earned his law degree at the University of Milan and a PhD or a doctorate degree in international relations at Tufts University at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. He's held positions at Harvard University's Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs and at the Kennedy School of Government, the U.S. Institute for Peace, the Rand Corporation, and as well as the Center for Security Studies in Zurich. He's the author of several books, uh, important books. Um, he wrote a book which I would recommend entitled The New Muslim Brotherhood in the West, which was published in 2010 by Columbia University Press. There's an Arabic edition as well. Um, and his book, he, he, the book offers a comparative analysis of Islamist organizations in Western countries, as well as a wide ranging policy response for that Western leaders uh, should adhere to, I would argue. His most recent book is entitled The Closed Circle, Joining and Leaving the Muslim Brotherhood in the West. And it offers an unprecedented inside view into how one of the world's most influential political Islamist organization operates and how some of the individuals make very difficult decisions to leave. Uh, Lo uh, Lorenzo Vadino has testified before the US Congress and other parliaments around the world and has advised law enforcement officials internationally. He's taught at universities in the United States and in Europe, and he provides regular analysis for top uh, media of record from around the world. So it's really an honor and a pleasure to introduce you to Lorenzo today to have him here. So thank you, Lorenzo, for being here. And the last time I saw him, he joined us um, for an amazing conference at the, in Rome that we had a couple of years ago, and his contribution there was important, and I have no doubt that today's seminar will be no different. So Lorenzo, thank you for taking the time and being with us. Thank you, Charles. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, yeah, I do remember last time we saw in person. I hope we'll be again soon in person. And thank you to everybody joining us today. Um, well, as, as you mentioned, and, and uh, that's been my, my body of work for the last 20 years, has been largely on the Muslim Brotherhood in the West. And that's what we're going to be discussing today. And that's a, it's a very interesting uh, topic. Uh, it, it's a bit of a niche topic. I think a lot of people that might be listening to us today are familiar with the Brotherhood in, in Egypt, in other Arab uh, and Muslim majority countries. Uh, but the Brotherhood in the West is a bit of a different beast. It has obviously a lot of similarities to uh, the mother group in the Arab world, but operating as an Islamist group in non-Muslim majority countries in Europe or in North America, it is a bit different. Um, it is different in how it operates, it is different in what it wants, uh, and it is different in even how it presents itself. I mean, the first controversy, the first challenge that exists around the Brotherhood in the West is even identifying it. Uh, if you're looking at Egypt, at Jordan, at Yemen, and any Arab or Muslim majority country, there will be no controversy in identifying the Muslim Brotherhood. They present themselves as such, we have a business card often that says Muslim Brotherhood, even in countries in which they are illegal and uh, suffer very severe consequences for being uh, identified as Muslim Brotherhood, there's, a fair, there's, there's an openness to some degree. In the West, you will not find a single organization that will call itself Muslim Brotherhood. You will rarely find an individual that will openly say, I am a member of the Muslim Brotherhood in Germany, in Canada, in Spain, and so on and so forth. So there's a level of uh, uh, deceit, if you want, lack of transparency, uh, which brings a lot of challenges in even identifying what we talk, what are we talking about when we 
talking about Muslim Brotherhood in the West. Uh, let me give a one minute history of what I mean by Muslim Brotherhood in the West and that puts a lot of the things that I'm going to be discussing about in context. It's a story that starts more or less in the 50s and 60s uh, when um, a handful of prominent members of the Muslim Brotherhood from Egypt, from Syria, from a couple of other Arab countries fleeing persecution in their countries of origin, moved to the West, received political asylum, and also joined a larger group of students, mostly graduate students, that went uh, from the Middle East to study to European and North American universities. Uh, was a small group of, let's call them pioneers of the Muslim Brotherhood, created the very first clusters of the Brotherhood in the West. At the time, very small, very unorganized, and mostly thinking about going back home. To them, it was a temporary exile from Egypt, from Syria, from their countries of origin. Uh, and the idea was always going back uh, and creating an Islamic state back home. Well, uh, that obviously, as we all know, didn't happen. And for a long time, what happened is that many of these individuals remained in the West and have stayed in the West for the last 40, 50 years. What they have done in the West is that they have recreated some of the structures of the Brotherhood in, uh, in the East, in the Arab world, just on a much smaller scale, of course, uh, smaller numbers than you would have in Egypt. And what they have done is basically created a structure that has two faces, has two uh, sides of the same coin. There's a secret structure, of what is the Muslim Brotherhood in the West. So a small group of activists in each country uh, that operates independently from the East uh, and does not present itself publicly as Muslim Brotherhood. So it's fair to talk about a French branch of the Muslim Brotherhood, a Swedish branch of the Muslim Brotherhood, a Swiss branch of the Muslim Brotherhood, and so on and so forth, exactly like we have an Egyptian, a Syrian, a Jordanian, a Moroccan, and a Tunisian, and so on and so forth. Those are basically branches of a large global family. There's obviously uh, constant communication and cooperation among all these entities, but at the end of the day, the much smaller entities of this family that exist and operate in the West are independent. They're free to choose their tactics and goals independently. Now, as I said, none of these entities will call themselves Muslim Brotherhood in the UK, in Germany, and so on and so forth. What they have done, and this is the big difference from the East, is that they have created this organization, a large uh, number of organizations that publicly present themselves with a very soothing uh, message, with a very moderate facade, and with names that seek to give the semblance of representativeness. So they will call themselves the Islamic Society of Germany, the Muslims of France, the American Organization of All Muslims. Uh, the idea of this, let's call them front, facade, let's, we can call them simply public faces of the network, is to basically be the presentable face of the Muslim Brotherhood in the West. Uh, what has happened is that these organizations have been able, for a variety of reasons, but I would mention two in particular, uh, have been able to really become, uh, to really punch above their weights, and in many cases become the go-to Muslim voices that many Western establishments engage with when dealing, when trying to reach out to Muslim communities. Uh, the two factors that I would say have really helped them is, one, their superior mobili uh, mobilization skills. The fact that a lot of these individuals who run brotherhood organizations in the West are very well educated, all of them have graduate degrees, they know the environment in which they operate, and when compared to some of the leaders of other Muslim organizations in the West, they clearly stand up for their, uh, for their skills and educational backgrounds. Second, I would say more important is resources, funds. For over 50 years, these organizations have been able to benefit from tens of millions of dollars coming in from the outside, mostly from the Arab Gulf. Today, it's basically Qatar and Turkey that are funding these, these entities. And obviously, thanks to those resources, create this impressive web of, of structures, of organizations, 
uh, will range from businesses to civil rights organizations, from charities uh, to lobbying groups, uh, all part of his family of, as I said, a few hundred individuals in every Western country, but very influential, very, uh, very much involved in, uh, in many activities. Um, so we're talking about a, a, a group that has been able to uh, create for itself this position of influence. And how are we planning on using, or how have they tried to use this position of influence over the last 20, 30 years? Well, in two ways. The first way is influence in the Muslim community. Uh, so trying to, through their uh, proselytism, to their networks of mosques, to their publication of books, uh, which again all funded from funds coming from, uh, from outside the West, to sell their politicized and extremist interpretation of Islam, mostly I would say their politicized interpretation of Islam to local Muslim communities. And the second goal has been that of being seen as the gatekeepers, uh, the representatives of Muslim communities in the West in the eyes of Western governments, Western media, Western establishments. Uh, of course, there are mixed results in their efforts to do that. We should, I'm generalizing a lot. I think we could have a different analysis depending on the country, but they've had this ability to be in some cases entrusted with teaching Islam in public schools, that is true in many European countries, in being this, the uh, guests that are invited on, uh, on TV when it comes, whenever there are debates on any issue that is one way or the, uh, the other uh, related to Islam. Uh, they are sort of the familiar faces, uh, in many cases, that policymakers, the media, um, civil rights organizations, interfaith groups reach out to when we're trying to get a Muslim voice. Now, why is this situation problematic? Um, we're not talking necessarily about a matter of terrorism. Uh, I think the debate is often, particularly in an American setting, framed in, in, from the point of view of terrorism. And that is only partially correct when we're talking about the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, on one hand, does not engage in terrorist activities in the West. It is not behind the, the bloody terrorist attacks that we have seen in Europe and North America over the last 20 years. That is the work of other groups. At the same time, there are two problems, security-related problems when it comes to the Brotherhood. One is its constant and fairly open support of Hamas, uh, which of course does not carry attacks in the West, but is still very much a terrorist organization designated both in the US and Europe. And second, uh, the Brotherhood in the West uh, propagates a narrative that, while not directly endorsing violence, leads to violence. It creates a mindset of us and them. It justifies violence in other parts of the world. It builds a narrative that is conducive to an, uh, and, and it's fertile ground for more radical organizations to seize upon and further radicalize Western Muslims. So it's, it's a gray area as to whether the, the Brotherhood can be seen as a terrorist organization or not. And we can maybe discuss that in the Q&A, what's the debate in the US when it comes to designation. The European approach, and I really see a big gap between Europe and the United States, particularly over the last few years, has been that yes, the Brotherhood is concerning from a security point of view, but it's not a terrorist organization. Nonetheless, it is a highly problematic group because of the narrative that it espouses. Because in mainstream, due to its machine of mass publications of influence, uh, it disseminates a narrative that is highly polarizing and contrary to, the, to any effort to integrate uh, Western Muslims in Western societies. It is a narrative that is unacceptable from the point of view of anti-Semitism, from the point of view of uh, equality between men and women, from a variety of other issues that have to do with core human rights, the narrative of the Brotherhood is unacceptable. Now, the, the, the Germans have a very interesting, German intelligence is a very interesting category for the Brotherhood. They call them legalistic Islamist organizations. And it monitors them. So German intelligence devolves import, important resources in monitoring and understanding the Brotherhood because it sees them as a problem. They're not a terrorist organization. That's a separate category which the Germans have. 
It is a legalistic extremist organization. It means that it, it's efforts fall for the most part, not entirely, but for the most part within the law. So they cannot be banned, they cannot be designated as a terrorist organization, but nonetheless, they are problematic. A member, being a member of the organization carries its consequences, and it's a duty of the state to monitor this organization and put some obstacles in what this organization can do. Um, this is where a lot of the, the European debate is going. You might have seen the debate that uh, the, the, the speech that Macron, French President Macron, gave a couple of months ago. It's pre-COVID, so it feels like a different era. Um, but he spoke uh, about an unacceptable separatism that the Brotherhood and other political Islamist groups are operating in French society. And what he said is that the, what they are doing is legal. It's not illegal. They exercise their right to free speech, but they are driving a wedge between French society and the Muslim community. And that in the long term is arguably even more problematic than terrorism. Terrorism is becoming coming to be seen by a lot of European policymakers as obviously a troubling phenomenon, but as not as severe of a threat as the long-term so social engineering uh, that groups like the Brotherhood, the legalistic Islamist organizations operate. Uh, this is where, again, in a pre-COVID era, until two or three months ago, very much the, Euro the, the European debate was heading in attention to these groups with all the difficulties that come in trying to challenge a group that operates largely within the law. And so the limits of what can be done, of course, are, are very severe. Charles, I might want to leave it there. I, I, I think that's probably for initial remarks uh, enough. I'm happy to clarify any point and answer questions. Okay, great. Th thank you very much, Lorenzo. Yeah, you, you, you touched on many important issues. So I'll start with a couple of questions and then I'll turn to anybody who would like to submit a question who's listening in. I'll try to incorporate as many questions into the conversation as I can. So please feel free to uh, send your questions to me. Um, so thank you for your overview. I, I was, I, there's two issues that sort of struck me. Um, you, you point out interestingly, and this is the long legacy of the Muslim Brotherhood in the West, Many of the leaders came in the 1950s and 60s from Egypt and other parts of the Middle East, Syria, as refugees. And the, some of them were intellectual students uh, who did well in the university. President Morsi, I believe, was a professor in California before he got his uh, job in his brief position in Egypt. Um, so there is this legacy, particularly in the, in the United States, of the Muslim Brotherhood being there. Can you touch on the influence that they've had in university campuses, in student organizations, but also intellectually. So I'm thinking of the BDS movements, the Students for Justice in Palestine, the Muslim Student Association, with a long legacy in association directly or indirectly with the Muslim Brotherhood. And I'm also thinking of the influence in the academy with intellectuals, um, with uh, Tarek Ramadan, people like Judith Butler who portray themselves as progressive liberals, you know, making the, the argument that Hezbollah and Hamas should be seen as part of the progressive left. So what is the influence in the university among student groups and among intellectuals in the West? And then I have one more question I'll, I'll ask later. Yeah, no, you touched on a, on a very, very, very important point. And I think that conversation, that analysis is particularly true when it comes to the US more than any other country. I think when we start actually with, let me start with a side note. I think there's often this misconception that Islamism in general and the Brotherhood as well are European problems and there's less of a problem in the US. That might be true when it comes to jihadists, but when it comes to the Brotherhood, it's the other way around, for sure. The U.S. has a, arguably the largest by numbers and most sophisticated by, by quality Brotherhood network in any Western country. And that has to do largely with the large number and excellent quality of its universities. Uh, the Brotherhood is an elite group. Uh, it recruits only the top of the top after a very lengthy selection process. So it's university students. I'm hard pressed to think of any member of the Brotherhood that does not have at least a graduate degree. And as you correctly pointed out, Mursi, 
was actually uh, finally joined in Southern California, not in Cairo, but in Southern California, when actually I can mention a lot of examples of similar dynamics. Um, so it's a network that in the West was born on college campuses. The, the embryo of a network in the United States is the Muslim Student Association, uh, which started in the late 60s, early 70s in, uh, in the University of the Midwest, but then it spread and uh, it, it basically on every college campus, save for a few exceptions, today you will find that there is generally speaking only one Muslim organization, which is the MSA. So if you're a politically active Muslim student, you're a freshman, you arrive on campus, you want to be engaged, and that's completely understandable and fair and uh, admirable, you only have one option, uh, and that's a Muslim student association. Now, does every single member of the Muslim student association belong to the Brotherhood? Of course not. Does the, do the upper echelons, the, do the higher ups of the MSA at the national level belong to the Brotherhood? That's a much more likely scenario. It's, it's a way in which a small network of very cunning leaders manage to spread their influence all the way down uh, at the local level. So MSAs, and again, it goes back to what the two uh, factors that I mentioned earlier, uh, capabilities, smarts, and, and funding resources uh, have the ability to organize events that attract a lot of people uh, from which the Brotherhood recruits the best and with the others it's happy to influence. Now the way the MSA operates uh, is that of course in a typic in typical Muslim Brotherhood fashion you can apply that analysis that I'm not going to make about college campuses to any other aspect of the Brotherhood uh, network uh, it works with all sorts of partners. It reaches out, it partners with uh, any actor that it believes it could further its agenda. And it's not above the brother, it's not beneath the brotherhood to work with any sort of group, no matter how theoretically uh, inconceivable for us could be that alliance. So there would be no problem for some of these organizations to work uh, uh, one day with a Jewish organization, something that inoculates them from any accusation of being anti-Semitic, and they will work with that Jewish organization on issues that have to do with freedom of religion on campus or something like that, some common cause. The next day they would work uh, with a close alliance, have an event with LBGT groups, and the third day they will host the most anti-Semitic, uh, most homophobic Salafi preacher on campus. No problem doing the three activities together. Um, but it, it, and this, it shows the, the cynicism of the network, but it's also its tactical ability to, uh, to operate in a very clever way. Now, let me close with the top level, which is the academia. Um, of course, there are several individuals within the Brotherhood Network who uh, are pro professors. Uh, but the way it works mostly with Brotherhood members is that they have been able to fund several uh, centers, several academic activities, um, several programs within universities, leveraging funds that came from overseas. So getting friendly, uh, very wealthy donors from Gulf countries, uh, and these days, uh, that means mostly Qatar, uh, but also means a non-Gulf country, Turkey, uh, to fund research, or anyways, fund in different ways uh, work being done at universities. Uh, again, uh, not everybody that is friendly to Brotherhood position is a Brotherhood member. The Brotherhood works very much with this idea of fellow travelers slash useful idiots. In some cases, it's the former, in some cases, the latter, and difficult at times to, to know which one. Uh, but of course, uh, in a field that is largely dominated by, both by post-colonial theory and a certain outlook, uh, it is fairly easy for the Brotherhood, uh, also when it comes bearing financial gifts, to strike a lot of tactical alliances with left-leaning professors uh, who will uh, come together with the Brotherhood on a, as I said, post-colonial, anti-Western, anti-Israel uh, uh, narrative. Uh, that's, without being overly pessimistic, sort of the general environment. Okay, thank you, Lorenzo. I'm going to ask two brief questions and I'll turn it over to other people to pose their questions. Uh, so very quickly, um, 
Hezbollah was recently banned from Germany, so it's banned. The, it's completely banned, banned now in Germany, the military wing and the political wing in the United Kingdom and North America. And now it's still, the political wing is still legal in France. Do you think that there's a renewed uh, possibility that Hezbollah and perhaps the Muslim Brotherhood, which is promoting uh, vile anti-Semitism and anti-democratic ideology, they're out to destroy democracy essentially, do you think that there is a possibility in this moment that governments are rethinking this anti-democratic, uh, anti-Semitic ideology and political activities in, in countries that now have accepted laws and created legislation to protect against racism, anti-Semitism, homophobia, sexism, you know, to protect basic democratic notions of citizenship. You think that there's a will now to understand the dangers that the Muslim Brotherhood and Hezbollah would pose to Europe? I think that is, that is the trend. That has been the trend for the last few years. And I would say, especially the last couple of years have been less Europe in particular has been less the target of terrorist attacks. That has allowed the security establishments to focus more on the mid to long term threats like the Brotherhood. Uh, 2015, 16, you had basically one terrorist attack every couple of weeks in Europe. The attention was all on the jihadists. Now things have changed and there's more attention on this kind of threats. Um, I think that's the general assessment throughout Europe. I think that's fair for every country, some more, some less. But there's focus from the security services and more political will, that's for sure. Now, designation, I mean, laws will be different in every country and they tend to be fairly different. It's a big move. Also, when it comes to the Brotherhood, the Brotherhood, as I said at the very beginning of my presentation, is not one unified entity. That has been the debate also in the U.S. If you're designating the Muslim Brotherhood, what are you exactly designating? The group in Egypt, it's 50, 60 branches in different countries. They take different names. What about groups in Europe that call themselves Muslim Society of Germany? Is it Muslim Brotherhood or not? Now, the, the formally it isn't. Easy, it's fairly easy to make a, de facto, a case that de facto they are, but it gets complicated. To me, it's not an either or proposition where you have either you designate and they're a terrorist or you leave them alone, they're nice and it's not a problem. There's a big gray area there of things that can be done uh, without a designation. I think that applies to the United States as well. First of all, well, as, as an Italian, I always like the, the Al Capone uh, story, a lot of things that can be done without necessarily uh, designating. You know, Al Capone was not brought down for the, the hundreds of people he killed was brought down because as a good Italian, he didn't pay his taxes. And I think a lot of a lot can be done against brotherhood networks from that point of view, uh, immigration, fiscal issues. So yeah, there's, there's way of weakening uh, that network in that way. Uh, my uh, good friend, Maji Nawaz, has always said one thing, legal tolerance doesn't equate uh, civic tolerance. And I think that's really where I would like the debate to go. These groups might be allowed to operate. They might be, as the Germans call it, legalistic. It doesn't mean they, they have to be persona grata uh, and sit at the tables that matter. KKK is, is legal in the States, and that's fine, but they're persona non grata in 99.9% .9 of places. And I think that ideally would be a scenario that I see for the problem. And very briefly, because we have a lot of questions, do you think that the... Um the changes in the Middle East and the new alliances that are emerging and the Saudis seem to be concerned not only about the threat of Iran, but also of the Muslim Brotherhood. Do you think that's also having an impact in the European context and in the United States to some extent? Absolutely. Uh, the fact that the bulk of the Gulf countries, with the notable exception of Qatar, have revised their position on the Brotherhood and become staunch enemies of the Brotherhood, that is, true for the Saudis and the Emiratis in particular, uh, plus Egypt. Uh, that has been a geopol massive geopolitical change for the Brotherhood. Uh, it prevented massive flow of money to them uh, as political support. And if anything, these countries are exercising a lot of pressure on European, on, on Western governments in general to change their attitude, to be more aggressive. That's actually the complaint you hear from most countries, that the West is not doing enough against the Brotherhood. Yeah. Uh, on the opposite end, of course, you got Qatar and Turkey that exercise the opposite pressure. 
Cool. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to turn to the questions. We have a question from Danielle El Gamri. Danielle is a former advisor to the UK government and the, the cabinet of the British government, a graduate of the LSC. And he's, his question is doublespeak, takia, uh, is at the heart of the, how the Brotherhood operates. In Arabic, it's abundantly clear that the goals of the organization, or what the goals of the organization are. In English, we know that they are more reconciliatory, they're more diplomatic. So the question that Daniel has is, are the European wings of the Brotherhood aiming for a more uh, European Islam or a more, or a more is Islamized Europe? Uh, that is to say, uh, wanting to seek concessions from Muslim minorities versus pragmatically trying to change perceptions of Islam in the West. Very good question. Um, generally speaking, I tend to be on the pessimistic side of this, uh, of this question meaning that the Brotherhood in the West being mostly run by people who are, as I said, very clever, very well educated. At this point, mostly run by people who are Western born, Western educated, Western born. There's been a demographic uh, change within Brotherhood networks. They know exactly what language to speak. They know exactly what words to use and what words not to use, what frames resonate with uh, the Western interlocutors and what, uh, what concerned them. Uh, so it's, I think it's fair to say that they have an ability to present themselves in a certain way, but it doesn't take that much scratching of the surface to understand what, uh, what they really want. Um, you may have going to get um, go into a shameless self pitch for the for my last book, but you mentioned it earlier, so it's less shameless. Uh, what I did for the book is that I interviewed some 15 former members of the Brotherhood in the West. These are people who were full fledged members in, uh, in a variety of Western countries and left and spoke to me in many cases for a couple of two or three days. Um, and all of them told me pretty much the same story as to, for example, what is the literature that is read inside the Brotherhood? Not necessarily the one they would produce, uh, you mentioned Tariq Ramadan, that would have his nice, soothing uh, books written with the language of post-colonial uh, theory and European Islam and so on and so forth. The core curriculum that the Brotherhood studies on a daily basis, the curriculum you have to know to become a full-fledged member is identical to the curriculum you had to learn in Egypt or Syria or the Arab countries. And it's still very much the same ideologues we read. It's still Albana, it's still Qutub, it's still Ghazali, it's still Karadawi. It's the same core individuals who have very problematic views. So uh, I, I want, of course, be fair. And as any other movement, there's diversity of opinions. There's evolution. The Brotherhood today has different views in the West, has different views than 50 years ago. Um, there might be an evolution, and there's clearly a Westernization to some degree. Uh, but I remain skeptical of the fact that there's been much of a change. And at the end of the day, it's mostly about their ability to devise better tactics rather than changing their substance. Okay, thank you, Lorenzo. Uh, Michael Diamond from Canada would like to ask you, to what extent is the Muslim Brotherhood involved and encourages the growth of Sharia financing in the West, in North America and Europe? Very much so. Uh, one of the gentlemen who invented the concept of, uh, of Sharia finance, Mahmoud Abu Saud, lived in Virginia for a long time, conceived the, the notion while living in the States. One of the very first Islamic uh, banks, Sharia compliant banks, was incorporated in Copenhagen. Um, again, it's the fact that some of the liberties in the West allow them to do certain things that might not have been allowed to do in the, in the countries of origin. Uh, the concept of Sharia finance uh, is something which, it's not just a brotherhood uh, construct, uh, but of course, core Brotherhood members uh, have participated in its, in its creation. And of course, Brotherhood being this very opportunistic group, I understood it, it's, it's a big source of money. So you will find a lot of individuals linked to the Brotherhood uh, that sit on the Sharia board of, uh, of different, uh, different banks uh, uh, that are very much involved in the business. It's very similar to the halal meat business. It's again, another construct which in which the Brotherhood sees a way to make money 
uh, and gain power and rub elbows with, with powerful people, which is really what the Brotherhood kind of uh, kind of wants. So it has always uh, pushed the notion very substantially. Okay, thank you. And Deborah Glazer wants to ask you, despite the FBI injunction against uh, meeting with them, please explain why so many U.S. members of Congress wrote congratulatory letters to CARE on the occasion of its recent celebration. How can we convince Congress that CARE should not be present as a legitimate civil rights organization, but rather is a problematic entity? It's a very, very good question. Um, and I think it's very difficult. And I think to some degree in the States we've gone back. I think there was more awareness uh, of, of some of these dynamics uh, 10, 15 years ago than now. Uh, the letter uh, that was mentioned in which the FBI uh, told its field offices not to meet with CARE was written, uh, I believe it was 2009. If not 2009, it's one year before, one year after that. Um, a lot of water under the bridge since then, and people tend to, to forget. Uh, a group uh, like CARE has been able to become much more mainstream today but it, but it was 10, 15 years ago. Um, combination of reasons. It's their ability to be, to do some of the things that I mentioned earlier, to strike a lot of alliances with different groups, which legitimize them. Uh, it's difficult for people to accuse care of being anti-Semitic, uh, uh, intolerant, uh, when they organize events on a daily basis with Jewish groups, LBGT groups, all other, array of groups involved in civil rights and civil liberties. Uh, there's, uh, you know, I can't speak to the individual members of Congress that meet with care. There's uh, uh, ignorance, laziness. People don't really do their, uh, their homework and meet with whoever in a well-meaning way. Uh, they want to reach out to the Muslim community and they don't know better that care does not necessarily represent the Muslim community. It's a self-appointed uh, representative with a lot of stains in its past and I would argue in its present. Um, for some other people there are some electoral gains potentially to be made by working with certain groups. Uh, it's a combination of, of reasons. I would say finally, last point, and that is particularly, I'm sorry to be so, so, so pessimistic on the states and so critical to some degree, generally speaking with exceptions the criticism of the Brotherhood and Brotherhood groups in the States has not reached the mainstream over the last 10 years in the way it has in Europe. Uh, it has been limited very much with a few exceptions to the fringe. Uh, it would not be uncontroversial for major newspapers in Germany, in France, in the UK to have very critical views and exposés uh, very investigative reporting. I was reading one in, uh, about a German group in Die Welt, which is one of the main German uh, newspapers. Uh, there's an open debate in the States. I can't imagine the New York Times or the Washington Post running this kind of stories on American Brotherhood groups. They, would, they used to do it back in 2004, 2005. A lot of things happen and that's no longer So it's a very different debate in the States, a very different level, consequent a very different level of awareness of the problem in the States compared to most European countries. So, so touching on that briefly, because we have a lot of questions, I don't want to, you know, control the whole conversation, but do you think that the Obama administration played a central role in creating kind of the new discourse or the new intellectual and political environment? Because it still, it boggles my mind as I, I consider myself somebody concerned about human rights, citizenship, equality under one legal system, I'm kind of a progressive person brought up in the social democracy of Canada. I kind of come from that human rights background. And in the United States, it boggles the mind that when you're critical of the Muslim Brotherhood, you're perceived as being very right wing, or you must be a Trump supporter, or you must be a Zionist, and you're not necessarily a scholar. So the, the discourse is really difficult. To, I, I find the terrain is very difficult to present these views in the United States. And do you think that President Obama going to Cairo, uh, inviting the Brotherhood as the distinguished guest, engaging radical Islam, that there's still this lag among the media of record and intellectuals that 
the Muslim Brotherhood are not progressive partners that should be counted on? Why, why is it so difficult in the U.S. compared to other places? Uh, if I had an answer, Charles, I, <laughs> I, I've been working with you 20 years and trying to, to uh, have a more contributing, trying to have a better debate on this in the U.S. Um, complicated. And, uh, but, but I said before, and I agree with you, so that the debate has gone back. I think in the States, you, you, we had a much better debate in 2003, 2004, compared to what we, we have now. And yeah, I think, yeah, indeed, uh, some of what the Obama administration did is part of it. It's not the only reason. It's the going to Cairo, as they somewhat reaching out uh, domestically as well. It wasn't just done uh, in Egypt and uh, in Syria uh, or in Tunisia. It was done also domestically. And generally speaking, it was a softer uh, approach. Uh, there's other reasons I think I'd have to do more with, uh, to some degree, and I'm not passing judgment here, the acceptance that exists in the States for extremist speech. Um, the Europeans have less tolerance for that. And, but, you know, something like the First Amendment is inconceivable in, in a country like Germany. And that has implications as to uh, how the Brotherhood is perceived. Uh, you know, anti-Semitism is one of the ways in which Authorities in Germany and Austria, for example, go after Brotherhood networks significantly. That wouldn't be necessarily the case in the US. It would, again, make them sort of persona non grata in civil society, ideally, but it doesn't necessarily cast the same stigma that it has in, um, in, uh, in Europe. There is more of an acceptance in the States, again, historically, not passing judgment here, just different trajectories of sort of living in a parallel way, sort of creating a parallel society. Uh, Europeans uh, pride themselves of having some more homogeneous societies. Uh, you can have a more multicultural approach in the UK, but at the end of the day, a certain idea of living apart is not really accepted in Europe. In the US, is much more. It, it's a combination of all these factors. I would add the final factor when it comes to uh, to law enforcement, because the, the debate is very much driven, at least at the beginning in Europe, by law enforcement intelligence agency. In the US, no agency has a mandate to look at an organization like the Brotherhood. There's no domestic intelligence agency. The FBI is uh, arguably the best law enforcement agency on the face of the planet, but doesn't do domestic intelligence, doesn't really do it. They open investigations when they, know, when they think that they suspect that the law has been broken, but that's not really how it works with the Brotherhood. They would open an investigation on, on a certain Brotherhood network if they suspect they're channeling money to Hamas, but not because of what they say in their mosques. So just over the weekend, the speech came out at, at Dar al-Hijra, which is arguably the flagship mosque of the Muslim Brotherhood in Falls Church, Virginia, one of the largest in America. The Imam was saying that COVID-19 is a punishment to the corruption of the scene of Western, and in particular Jewish work the usual sort of anti-Semitic, anti-Western trope that comes from the Brotherhood. This is a mosque that is still used for engagement by the State Department, by DHS, by FBI. It just stuff that doesn't make it to the mainstream. Memory covered it, it's great, but it doesn't really get to the mainstream, so. It's important, thank you. So Nir Bombs uh, asks, uh, a number of countries have begun to designate the Muslim Brotherhood as a terrorist organization. You touched on it earlier. Some of these designations clearly are those countries from the Gulf have pointed out other arms of the Muslim Brotherhood in the West and including the United States. Do you think that this direction could potentially help to increase uh, the power of the, of, of the Muslim Brotherhood organs in Europe or in the United States? The, the debate on designation is very, very complex and that's a good question from Nia. Um, I think there's one line of thinking that argues that certain branches of the Brotherhood can be designated. Uh, there are branches in Libya, in Syria, in Yemen that are directly engaged in violence. There's a couple of spin-off groups of the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood that have already been designated by the State Department. So it's, it's not a long shot. I think the argument is, and it gets very technical and legal, as to whether you designate the Muslim Brotherhood as sort of the big umbrella organization, or you go after some specific uh, specific groups. 
Then the question is, let's say you make that step, you take that step. The next one is, what are the implications for groups in the West that have historical, ideological, organizational, financial connections to the Muslim Brotherhood in the Middle East? Do you go after them as well or not? That's also the million dollar question. It's a matter of both evidence and political will. Uh, and different countries, at least in Europe, are thinking about doing it in different, in different ways. Um, there's a couple of European countries that have norms in their, in their constitution that argue that the state can shut down organizations that espouse values that are against the, that country's constitution. No such thing, of course, in the US constitution, but it does exist in some of those countries. And it's not such a far-fetched argument to say that that can be applied to the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, it takes a lot of political will, because of course these are groups that have uh, entrenched themselves uh, in society, they have a lot of defenders in political parties, mostly but not only on the left, uh, in the media, so there will be a lot of people who come to bat and, uh, and oppose this kind of course of action. Okay, thank you Lorenzo. So we have a question from Professor Giuseppe Cescia. He, he gave a great uh, lecture last week for us, and he thanks us for inviting you, Lorenzo, and he appreciates your important speech. And he has a question for you, and he'd like to ask you if you can say something about the Muslim Brotherhood's dialogue with Christian organizations, specifically the Catholic Church and uh, related organizations, and its relationship with the progressive global left, which he considers, Giuseppe thinks, is, is a very important issue. But it's, it's instrumental use of interreligious dialogue is another powerful to, tool that is beginning to creep into Western societies. Maybe even more dangerous because it gives the Muslim Brotherhood the opportunity to turn some of its uh, natural competitors into their best supporters. This is becoming all the more evident during the Pope Francis's pontificate that is uh, pushing for an alliance between the Catholic Church and the global left. And he thanks you for your comments. Thank you. Uh, I, I think that's, that's the analysis. <laughs> I don't think I have to answer that. Anyway, I think that's a correct analysis. Uh, and I would apply the same, um, the same analysis to outreach to Jewish organizations or any other religious group. All these sort of outreach are for Brotherhood Networks instrumental to achieving their goals which are that of having influence in Western society. To basically, it's, it really goes, boils down to what does the Brotherhood in the West wants. Of course, he wants to support what Brotherhood groups, what Islamist groups are doing in the Middle East, but in the, in the West he wants to influence Muslim communities and he wants to be seen by Western establishments, and I really mean that in the broadest possible sense, as the go-to group, the representatives, the gatekeepers. Uh, of course, the more legitimate, the more, uh, let's call it well-meaning, uh, the groups to which they do outreach, the both of them, that they become able to vouch for them, the better it is for them. Who better than the Catholic Church as somebody that vouches for you if you want to operate in Italy, for example? Uh, or if your problem is unquestionably anti-Semitism, as it is for the Brotherhood, because <laughs> it is part of the DNA of the Brotherhood to have anti-Semitism, what better to, way to reject those accusations of anti-Semitism that you or I could make against these organizations and say, anti-Semitic, look, we just organized an interfaith meeting with Jewish organization X, Y, and Z the other day. So that's really, it's inoculation by engagement. That's what I, that's what I call it. And it, it, it's done 360 degrees and sometimes with the most unsuspecting and well-meaning of partners. Uh, but it is one way that enables them to become entrenched in the system. Yeah, I agree. Important. It's an important issue. So now Professor David Patterson from the University of Texas would like to ask you, uh, for the Muslim Brotherhood in the West, what has become of their sacred creed that, I quote, jihad is our path and death is, um, and death in service to Allah is our greatest desire. And although the non-Muslim Brotherhood groups continue terror activity, 
Are they not fundamentally influenced by the ideology of the Brotherhood of El Bana, Qutub, and other leading intellectuals? Absolutely. But the Brotherhood, so the Brotherhood has never renounced violence. Uh, and I think it's, uh, it's, a, it's a big lie uh, when people say that the Brotherhood has renounced violence. Uh, the Brotherhood simply applies a smarter, more pragmatic and tactical approach to the use of violence. Violence is used only when it makes sense. Uh, when it's the calculation, after a very detailed cost-benefit analysis, uh, assessment, uh, then the brother will decide whether to use violence, whether to use politics, whether to present itself as a moderate force or not. Now, that doesn't mean that the calculation is always correct, uh, but that's how it operates. Uh, and there's, there's sort of a, the, the three activities in which the brother uh, engages are violence, politics, and grassroots activism, what they call Dawa, proselytism. Uh, you should see it as sort of a as, um, percentage in every place and every time, the percentage of which it engages in one of the three activities changing changes based on the environment. What could the Brotherhood gain by carrying out attacks in Sweden in 2020? Very little. You're not gonna, you're not gonna achieve much. But Brotherhood leaders know that full well. They look at the jihadists who carry out attacks in in the West as silly uh, individuals who mean well. Uh, their heart is in the right place, but they choose the wrong tactics. What are you gonna achieve? You're only gonna harden uh, governments and public opinion against a long-term, gradual project in which the Brotherhood is engaging. So from their point of view, terrorism in the West, in this current time, is counterproductive. Now, they're also very good at turning a negative into a positive, because of course, they know that the terrorism exists. If you remember the first years after 9-11, they would always deny that it had anything to do with uh, uh, sort of problem in Muslim communities. And then at some point it became undeniable and said, well, you gotta work with us then. So guess who many of the partners of a lot of the counter-radicalization, radicalization prevention, effort that Western governments have, brotherhood organization that will say, well, we'll, we'll, we're the gatekeepers of the Muslim community, help us, uh, we will help you fix this radicalization problem. But generally speaking, they have no reason to engage in violence in the West. Libya, Syria, Gaza, totally different story. They, their calculation is that in that environment, that context, Violence is the right approach. But if you look at the literature uh, that the Brotherhood uses, violence is still very much there. Said Qutb, which is unquestionably the sort of intellectual godfather of, of contemporary Judaism, is still very much one of the two, three main sources of, of Brotherhood education, read and uh, with approval within, within the Brotherhood in the West. Thank you. We have another question from Michael Diamond in Canada, and he asks, if the Muslim Brotherhood achieved its objectives, how would our lives change in the West? And I think I would add a caveat. How have they influenced our lives in the West over the decades? Well, it depends what we mean by, by goals. Um, I think there's, there's, there's a long-term goal. Um, there's more of a goal, let's say, in our lifetime, uh, of course, the Brotherhood thinks a lot in terms of centuries in a way that very few Westerners do, but the Brotherhood does think that way. Uh, from their point of view, success in the near future, and by near I mean 10, 20 years, uh, what they would like to see is really sort of a separate Muslim community. Karadawi has written an entire book about it where it says Muslims should have their own ghetto, should have their own parallel society, and the Brotherhood would be the providers of all the services that are needed for that, provide, uh, for that society, from the cradle to the grave, uh, from the kindergarten all the way to the funeral park, uh, and everything in between. And of course, they would do so entrusted by Western governments. Uh, now, how that would be different, and making it even more actual, how has what has Brotherhood done uh, changed a lot of things? Well, it has, e even now. So even though I try to always put perspective, and uh, obviously 
the Brotherhood does not have the influence it wants to have. It has a lot of successes, a lot of people pushing back against it. And most importantly, within Muslim communities, a lot of people reject what the Muslim Brotherhood wants. So this image of them speaking for the Muslim community is absolutely not supported by facts. But they have been able to be recognized by many governments and establishments in general in the West as the representatives, as the go-to voices. And that has changed some, some policies and some narratives. Um, a concept, for example, like that of Islamophobia, which to some degree paralyzes uh, the course of action of certain, uh, certain countries, certain governments, is something that the Brotherhood is mainstream. It's not to say that Islamophobia is a full, complete invention. There is, of course, hatred against Muslims, exactly like there is anti-Semitism, is undeniably hatred against Muslims. But the instrumentalization and the politicization of, of that hatred is something that the Brotherhood has pioneered and mastered very well, and it uses it to obtain influence and change policies. Uh, it has an impact on the way security services operate. It has an impact on, uh, on little things like what, what art exhibits show, what publishers publish. We all remember the Danish cartoons controversy, which is something the Brotherhood very much orchestrated. One of the individuals I profiled in my latest book is one of the three Danish imams, Brotherhood members, who orchestrated Danish cartoon controversy. It was entirely Brotherhood way of getting back at the Danish establishment, extorting the Danish government to, to obtain more power. So it has an impact. It shouldn't be overestimated. Uh, but turning uh, blind eyes seems, seems a pretty silly uh, approach for the time being. OK, and we're, uh, we're running out of time, so we have two quick questions. Um, Naomi Khan would like to know, uh, What's the role of the Muslim Brotherhood in U.S. mosques? Mosques, and could you name a, a mosque in Brooklyn where she lives that is uh, very active in the Muslim Brotherhood? And then I have one more quick question about the United States. Do you know of a link between the Nation of Islam and the Muslim it's Brotherhood? Hours. Is there good research on the link between the Muslim Brotherhood and the yep. Nation? Of Islam? Uh, Sorry, the first question was, sorry, I got lost on the, the nation of Islam, the first one was. Yeah, so could you, what's the role of the Muslim Brotherhood in America? The mosques. And which mosque in, in yeah. Brooklyn comes to mind as a Muslim Brotherhood mosque? Uh, we go back to what I said about funding and resources. The Brotherhood networks can, can traditionally, historically, for the last 40, 50 years, have been able to be funded by substantial amounts coming from the Gulf, and of course, uh, one of the main ways in which they had invested that money is simply uh, buying land, buying and building mosques. So it's difficult to give an estimation, but it's fair to say that a good number of mosques, particularly the very large ones, the very expensive ones, are uh, controlled by, uh, by the Brotherhood. It's purely a matter of money, of resources. Your average local Muslim community would not have the resources to build the kind of expensive facilities that Brotherhood Networks have. Uh, and of course, most of the people that will go to these large mosques are not necessarily Brotherhood members. Majority will not, but of course, they will be listening to what the Brotherhood leadership at that mosque has to say about everything from religion to politics. Uh, Nation of Islam is a completely separate entity. There's not much of a relationship. Uh, the way the Brotherhood looks at them, it very much looks down on Nation of Islam, looks at it as a bit of a cult. Um, but the, uh, in the great Brotherhood tradition of exploiting uh, anything that comes in their way, they do recognize at times the, the power, the mobilization powers that Nation of Islam have. And they have at times done uh, uh, certain activities with Nation of Islam networks, mostly to bring some of the most prominent members of that media to the fold uh, and try to sort of get them back to what is considered by them to be Sunni uh, Islam orthodoxy. Uh, but generally speaking, there's not much of a relation. Okay. So Lorenzo, we, we have a strict policy to try and end on the top of the hour, so we're pretty close to that. So, Lorenzo, on behalf of the ISGAP team, really thank you very much for joining us and for all your, your really important work that you've been doing over the years. It's a continued success and strength for your important research. 
And I just would like to add that on, on the ISGAP website, you may have to search for it in our website, but there's a recent report that we put together on Students for Justice in Palestine at American universities. And there is some connection that we look at to the Muslim Brotherhood in the report. So if anybody's interested, um, please feel free to look for that. And I also recommend uh, Lorenzo's uh, book. His new book is The Closed Circle, Joining and Leaving the Muslim Brotherhood in the West. And his other works are, are really important. So I encourage anybody who's interested to uh, look for Lorenzo's work and books. So Lorenzo, thank you and uh, stay well. Thank you, thank you very much. And one more just announcement, next uh, Monday, we're going to have Professor Uzi Rabi. Uzi is the, uh, he's just became a full professor and he's the director of the Moshe Dayan Center of Middle East and African Studies. And he'll be speaking on the discourse and conspiracy theories around the virus in the Middle East. So everybody have a good week and be well. And next, this Wednesday's event is not going to take place. So we'll see you here on Monday. Be well, everybody.